Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Plaxon, and I am hosting today's show. So uh, with that, we've got some great guests lined up. Um, let's get started. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Tag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. So, you might be wondering, how do you get to ask questions? All you have to do is use the question panel on the right of GoToWebinar to submit your questions. Or, you can hop on Twitter to submit your questions with the hashtag Event Icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons with your hosts, Will Curran of Endless Events, Laura Lopez of Social Tables, and Brant Kruger of Event Technology Consulting. <laughs> All right. As I'm sure you're aware, I am neither Will Lor nor Brant. Um, my name is Alex Plaxon. Typically, I'm behind the scenes, live tweeting the show. Um, but today, I am moving in front of the camera. Uh, I've been a guest before on the show. I'm very excited to host my first show. Um, and like I said, we have some amazing guests with us today. Um, so without further ado... Um, Let's have them introduce themselves. So first, we've got uh, Karem Baran, who is the co-founder and CEO at Boomset. Who's hello, there. Uh, thank you, thank you for the introduction, Alex. And um, hello, everyone who's watching us today. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, as Alex mentioned, I'm the, I'm the CEO of Boomset. So we are an event technology company, and we focus on um, we focus on technologies to help event planners on site, such as uh, kiosk systems, checking, checking people in, um, uh, like NFC badges, and attendee tracking. And so, and today we're going to be talking about um, sustainability within events. Excellent. And our second guest is Hans Etten, who is the co owner of Masters in Moderation. Mm -hmm. uh, an international booking agency for moderators and facilitators. Yeah. Thanks okay. for joining us, Hans. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, and I'm, uh, go ahead. And okay, you are. Okay. It's midnight where you are. It's almost midnight. I was just uh, going to mention that. Yeah. It's it's very dark here. It's uh, it's a nice dark uh, autumn night here. It's almost midnight, uh, but it's a good time to have a conversation about sustainability. Yes, absolutely. And we'll get in. We will do a deep dive into sustainability today, which is why it's great that we have Nancy with us as well. Nancy Savada, CMP, founder and president of Meet Green. Uh, she's a leader, innovator, and entrepreneur in the meeting, planning, and events industry. Thanks for joining us, Nancy, as well. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Our, our, conference, or our event company produces conferences in an environmentally sustainable way, and all our events are done that way. We also provide consulting. Uh, was not here listed on my resume as I'm also a co-founder of the Green Meeting Industry Council. So I've been in sustainable events for 23 years. Excellent. Well, um, I think everyone's ready to get to know a bit more about each of you. Um, so let's start with our first question, uh, which we ask everyone on the show, which is what got you into the events industry? And let's start the opposite way. Let's start with Nancy. What got me into the industry? I was working at a healthcare firm. They decided that they needed to have an annual meeting, and I apparently drew the short straw and was assigned to produce the annual meeting. But I, I fell in love with it. I love the work. I love the, the project, the critical path. I love everything about it. And so it, it went from there. My, my family loves to take credit because they said I was planning parties very early. And I don't know about the rest of the people in events, but somehow our families still think we're party planners no matter what we do. So, so there you go. I'm still doing what they, they thought I, they trained me to do. But in sustainable events, I really got started in those because I, the choices we make as event planners can make a huge impact on our environment. And I, 
I saw the choices I was making daily, and, and that's what really drove me to sustainable events. Great. And how about yourself, Hans? What got you into the events industry? Well, somebody had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it sounds like a joke, but that's more or less how I uh, discovered that I was uh, working on it. Also, on a young age, just like Dempsey uh, said, it's more or less in your blood, I think. Um, um, I used to work in the environmental business, and uh, there I was on stage as a speaker on the reuse of soil, of uh, polluted soil. And um, after a while, they started asking me as a moderator instead of as a speaker. So I moderated those conferences, and uh, I liked that far better than being a speaker. Uh, it was more about the process, more about the um, getting the content across than talking about just a little piece of, of uh, the environmental business. So I had a, a broader scope and I could work with people. And well, and from that point on, every time there was a moderator needed uh, and nobody did it or did it well, I stepped in and uh, that's for, uh, how I became a, a moderator and got some experience in that. And when I look back at my youth, I did it for the first time when I was nine years old, I think, or ten years old, uh, at primary school, where there was an evening where, where all the kids could show what they were good at. But I wasn't good at anything, just reading, I think. And that's not nice to look at on stage. And <laughs> uh, so I stepped in and said, well, I present the show, and I'll announce all the uh, different acts and uh, make some jokes. So that's how it started. I think that's probably the earliest that any of us got started in this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I think that might be an event icon's record, actually. Okay, okay, but I think when you delve in deep, um, it's just like what Nancy said. It's somewhere in your blood, and if, if you go back into your youth, you know, maybe you find a, a location that's even um, earlier when you started organizing events or. Probably, probably for all of us, which is why we all fell in love with it so quickly. Exactly. Uh, and how about yourself, Karam? What uh, got you into the events industry? Um, so we we were waiting to get into an event in New York um, in meatpacking, and it was like um, midnight, and it was the, the venue was very crowded, and then. The, the line was taking so long to get in, and it was a big con inconvenience. Um, I told myself I would like to fix the inconvenience, and I would like to help people get into events more quickly. So that was kind of like seven, eight years ago. And since then, I've been working on fixing uh, problems in the event industry. Great. And what were you doing before that? I was working as a um, as a computer engineer in a technology company, like an IT company in New York. Great. All right. Now back to Nancy. If you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? I'd like to think I'd either be a marine biologist or an architect. Those are two things that I've always felt passionate about. Sometimes I think my job is halfway between those right now, but um, that's where I'd be. Excellent. I don't know if you know or have seen the show, but Will often talks about scuba gear as like his favorite resource that anyone has mentioned. But I, right. think might, I think you might be the first marine biologist wannabe that we've had. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, and how about yourself, Hans? What would you be doing uh, if you weren't in the events industry? I would probably still be in the environmental industry. I think being very depressed by now, maybe an alcoholic. And <laughs> <that>. <laughs> so I'm glad that I found this business because it fits me far better than the, uh, the other desk work I did. Great. And how about yourself, Karam? Um, I would still be in technology, but since graduation I have been on the consumer side, um, not just like consuming technology, but um, writing code and creating software. But um, if I wasn't in events right now or if I wasn't running my own business, um, I would go back and I would love to be a researcher about new technologies coming up and I would love to work with in, in a in a university and developing new technologies. 
Great. Well, I think we have a good idea of who each of you is. So let's talk about more about what you do. Why is the topic of event sustainability coming into the forefront of events right now? <clears throat> let's start with uh, Hans. Well, as a moderator, I, I come to a lot of conferences and um, I see a shift from um, the physical audience to the digital audience. I see a shift from um, adding a lot of entertainment to congresses to, to keep people happy um, to uh, getting more into the core of the business, into the content of the audience, uh, sorry, of the conference. So content is, is becoming much more important now. Uh, so I see all these kind of trends, all these kind of transitions and um, sustainability has been um, something that's been put on the event industry, I think, for maybe about 10 years now. Um, and it's growing and I think it's, it's changing uh, in, the, in the latest time. It's changing from what we did, we can, can we do that in a sustainable way, to uh, what we see more now. Um, can we be sustainable instead of do sustainable? And that's what's, um, what intrigues me. And uh, when Karem asked me if I could join the panel, um, I said, well, I can, I can tell you about all the things I see in different uh, conferences. Uh, I'm not very influential within the conference itself because I'm just on stage being a moderator. But uh, so, sometimes I get to advise my clients on, on all the things that they do for the conference, and uh, there are so many aspects in which you can be really uh, sustainable. Excellent. Karim, on kind of bouncing off of that, um, you know, for you, you are more on the technology side. So, mm -hmm. what do you see with event sustainability um, as far as trending? You know, you've been doing this for a while now. Um, are you seeing any changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so definitely, like it, 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 even when, like when we're, when we're working with technology, even without noticing, you're helping the environment. For example, we work, we work with a festival um, that used to um, that used to use um, like welcome booklets, and like this festival has twenty five thousand people, and then they were giving everybody a ten page welcome kit. So it, it, it ends up becoming like 350 pages of um, waste and uh, like 350 pages of footprint. So the idea really didn't come out of sustainability. The idea came from the, like the printing was really, the printing was becoming hard because let's say you have, well, you have a last minute sponsor and then they want to be in the booklet but all of these like 25,000 booklets are already printed so you either need to reprint them and now you have 700,000 pages of waste um, or you try to add a page there or you can't accept the sponsor. So, and, and also it became in a way that like people losing these booklets or they have to carry them all the way all the time with them. So instead like we were thinking what we can do and of course you can have an event app instead of giving somebody a booklet and telling them hey like this is something new for you and keep it for the next three days while you're drinking, while you're having fun, but instead of that you have a phone in your pocket that you keep with you all the time, that you can have all the updates there and then if there's a new sponsor, great, you do a push notification and say that, hey, the bar is sponsored by Heineken or um, like Stella and then you see that you, you, you have the freedom and also you're not, um, can, you're not um, taking all these trees because uh, you're, you're printing so much material. So, as much as we're using the technology more often, this is like we are becoming more sustainable. And now, like not only that, we are when when we see that a this is help, a this is really helping the event organizers to see uh, like it's giving them a great freedom to do have things digitally, and b it's making them feel better. And now, working around that, we started having the idea of not only going digital but why don't you try to save the world? So we have different packages that we are explaining to people by, hey, like instead of uh, using one-time wristbands, you can use reusable ones, you can use them in different events. It's both cost-effective for you and more sustainable. 
and people are adopting that. As as uh, like as for for example, when you go to Facebook, you start seeing a lot of uh, videos of plastic in the in the ocean, like the garbage land that we created as humans. So everybody has somewhere in their mind that they want to be sustainable, but they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And since, as event planners, we have a big footprint um, in places that we go. Um, when you come up with the idea, they love it and um, they get it, they, they adapt to it. I love the idea of saving the world. I think that's important. I think it's something that particularly the millennial mindset is thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy, why is the topic of event sustainability coming to the forefront of events? What trends are you seeing? What are you hearing uh, from your side of the planning side? I what I'm seeing now is people aren't any more interested in coming to lecture halls and sitting there and being talked to. It's all about the experience, right? Our events have changed so much just in the past year, few years. Everybody wants the experience. And the people hosting these want to look like good corporate citizens. So they can't look like good corporate citizens if they've got a garbage can full of styrofoam clamshells sitting there. People are snapping pictures. Social media has played a huge role. Now they're saying that events are windows to a company's soul, and I don't think that's ever been truer than it is today. So event organizers really are under the microscope for making their events, their experiences, their world a lot more sustainable, and I, I think that's great. Technology has been our friend from the start. Back in the day when exhibitor books came in these huge three ring binders and you know now they're online, things have changed so much, but a lot of that's thanks to technology. We have quite a few technology clients and they've been early adopters and they've also pushed Meet Green really to, to do our best and even have developed some technologies for us that we've needed to make it happen. So it's, um, I just think it's open out there and transparent right now. I love that, I love that, okay. So you mentioned a couple things. What are some of the most wasteful areas of an event, Nancy? I I think that the you know we uh, we just talked about the paper. Certainly, paper is a a huge wasteful event. If you've ever been on a trade show floor after it's over and just seen the mounds of paper, so waste is huge. Uh, really, the the events industry is focusing in on food waste now. That's also uh, a big issue. As just starting out, there's um, just so many areas, but I think those are the those are the two biggest ones. If you're going to tackle something, you know, taking a look at your waste management, recycling, end of life, and and that includes food. So I I think I know what Karam is going to say is the most wasteful area in an event. But let's ask you what what are some of the most wasteful areas of an event? Yeah, and I, I would like, actually, I also want to ask a question to Nancy, um, because I, I, it's always in my mind. So we are always um, tied into registration, and we're doing everything that we can do to cut um, waste in the registration. And the biggest help was, as I was mentioning, the exhibitor booklets and then the welcome kits, mm -hmm. and, um, because, um, like, we have big festivals, and in the U.S., like, Hans would know uh, better. Europe has always been big in festivals, and the United States is kind of catching up with that. And a lot of conferences are even adopting festival formats. For example, Airbnb Open was a 2,000 people conference uh, like three years ago. Now it's an 8,000 people festival. Um, same concept, but instead, as Nancy was saying, instead of just sitting down and working workshops, you go and you adopt the festival format, and then you, you attract more people and it's more fun and you can still uh, touch upon more people. So um, we have always been big on like saving people paper on like welcome kits and the goodie bags because at, at the same time like these goodie bags like everybody's receiving one and most of the time like not only the things which go in like the bag itself it's like everybody that throws it away or well, I have a hundreds of them I can't throw it <laughs> I feel bad I can't go to the kitchen and like show you the whole thing. Um, so um, that's how we have been helping people like digitalizing the goodie bags or like digitalizing the welcome kits. But I would like to ask Nancy, um, what, is there anything being done about the food as you, you have been mentioning? Because I know a lot of event planners are 
hey, I have six, I have, I am expecting 5,000 people, but I want food for 6,000 people. Great. And 3,000 people end up coming and then so many food is going to waste. So what are we doing right now? Can we give it to um, homeless or is there any organizations who are picking it up or is it even legal? Like how does it work? Sure, you want me to take that question, Alex? Okay. Yeah. All right, so there, that's kind of a two-pronged thing, right? So the first is really knowing the history of your organization or knowing who's going to show up because people who check a box on Monday on the registration form that they're going to be at Friday's lunch aren't there, right? It's 50% or so. So you've got to, as an event organizer, be really good at knowing your history or knowing who's going to show up. So that's, that's the first part about it. And I think in our industry, we we really need to look at what we think hospitality is because I think when you go to a, a buffet, for instance, if you're the first person through and you're the last person through, it shouldn't look the same. But in our industry, we've made this up that it should be, you know, the bin should be full, you should get all the different options. Well, if you come from a big family, you know when that plate comes around the table, you're still going to have food, but it might not be what you want. But we have to really as event organizers educate people because whenever I talk to caterers about doing this they're really hesitant because it comes back on them. So I think food waste is a, is a huge educational issue for our industry that we, we're we just starting to um, dip into but, but the way that hospitality looks it might be a little different in the future and that's okay but we have to make that okay. And on the other end once you've over ordered and there's lots of food um, you know, meeting planners are held ha harmless by in the U.S. by the Bill Emerson Act, and I can put that on the resources as well. But the Bill Emerson Act uh, makes it so that you're not liable for any food donated, and you're going to use a food bank. You're not just going to be putting the food out on the streets, right? So it's it's all done with safety security. There's a website called Second Harvest where you can go in and you just type in the zip code of where your event's going to be and it tells you all the local food banks. So okay. if, the, if the venue you're not meeting at doesn't know, you type it in, you show them, or you go to them directly and talk about how you can donate your leftover food. That's great. Does it work, Nancy? Do people do that? After the, yes, after they the... do. It's, okay. it's often a battle. Sometimes it's a battle with your venue and your caterer because it's extra work on their behalf. But it is vitally important. One in three children in the United States goes hungry every night. That's huge. There, there is no reason with the amount of food we have going through that we can't make a significant impact on that. So that could be part of your contract with your caterer. Absolutely. Absolutely should be. That's great. Um, Hans, I have a question for you. Um, what do you consider the hallmarks of a sustainable event? Uh, people feeling sustainable and um, be, it, it being a good event because there are, to be honest, loads of events that, well, are not really necessary or are being held but not being held in the, in the best way. So um, I think the best or the most sustainable event is the event that's, that's not there. So there's no footprint. And uh, if you do have to organize the event, um, make sure it's worthwhile and make sure that you you get the goals that you set for yourself and make sure that you achieve what you want with that uh, congress or conference um, if you do so then it's it has a value and i think um, to go back to your to your former question uh, what are the most unsustainable parts of events it's it's indeed paper it's also food and also the way food is produced and what types of food you're serving. Um, but it's also travel. People are getting together in one place and it takes a lot of travel. It takes a lot of miles to, to get there. Um, and air miles or air travel is maybe the most polluting thing um, of events. But on the other hand, if you have a group of people coming together and solving uh, all the world's problems, uh, <laughs> If, if a group of people from all over the world fly to a very unsustainable place in a very unsustainable way, but they are saving the world, uh, the value is higher. So um, you should always look at the value of your event, and that's connected to the goals of your event, and the way you organize it, or the way you, you, you make your uh, program and um, 
you look at the uh, experience that your, your attendees will get, uh, that will all help um, um, achieving your goals. And if your goals are met, then you have a good event. And then you look at all the different parts that you can make more sustainable. And most of the time, it's it's like um, it's looking at practical solutions. It's uh, which is very useful, of course. Um, and you can tweak all kinds of different aspects in your conference to make it more sustainable. But it really is about the human behavior or feeling um, sustainable or thinking or being sustainable. And I think that's the core of the of, of the question. That's the heart of the question. So one thing you mentioned that I find really interesting, and I think it's a difficult conversation to have, especially in this industry, um, is how do you make that decision and how do you talk to the stakeholders of the event to say this event is not worth having, that we could do this online or that we don't have to meet face to face for this event? How do you start that conversation? Um, well, the first question I ask my client is, what's the goal of your uh, meeting? Because if I know what's the goal of the meeting, then I can uh, decide uh, what person is the best moderator out of my agency. Um, who could moderate it best and help my client um, achieve their goals? So I have to know what the goal of the meeting is. And, and most of the time, the goal of the meeting is not so defined yet. And I have to help define those goals. I have to help my client in defining those goals. And during that process, um, when you're advising your client, you're on the same level and you can say, well, maybe um, the goal of these, this event can be met best next year and don't have your event this year. Or if the only goal of your event is uh, getting people up to date in information um, and, and make them have a good time um, uh, and get a team spirit, uh, send them an email or write a book for them and send it digitally and organize a, a, a barbecue or a, a, a party and don't do the event in, in a congress or conference uh, form. Um, and most of the time that triggers them to think better about the goal of their meeting. And that could mean that they change the whole nature of their meeting to get closer to that goal. Which could also be, uh, for instance, that they should do it. Um, they could do it uh, digitally uh, in the live stream instead of a live audience, or maybe a combination from, uh, of, of those two. Great, Nancy. If you had to have that conversation about whether or not to have the event face to face. Oh, absolutely. We've had we've had that, and I always advocate if it's education only, then let's get it online. We all listen to podcasts and webinars and. There's a lot of places to get education. If it is networking, then that's a, you know, a different situation. Is there a way to do it regionally and still have live streaming come in? Um, is there a way to do it that way as well? I think you know, you're right. Air travel is a huge thing that we don't want to talk about in this industry. And then planners get threatened. But I don't think it's a threat because even if you're doing something live stream, you've got registration. You've got to get the speakers. You've got to have moderators. You still have to have all the same disciplines, whether the people are sitting in the, the chairs at home or whether they're sitting chairs there. So I think as an industry, we have to stop being afraid of what that looks like and embrace it. And I think we could do with technology, we could do some very cool things, but we have to be willing to adopt it. Great. Karim, the planner wants to make sure their event is sustainable, or at least have a men minimal impact on the environment, where can they start? Where can, can they start? So, yeah, like, first of all, they need to identify their event in, like, different areas. So, as Nancy was saying, um, like, it, it can start with the food. Like, what can I do with the food? I can do this. And then, and not only, like, donating that, but also can I use reusable cups? For example, um, I went to WeWork offices a couple days ago, and they had they they now transformed into metal cups. They're, they don't have any plastic anymore, and then they're reusing it. Yes, maybe they had to buy um, x amount of dishwashers because now like more and more uh, like they have more and more dirty cups to wash. But they're opting in, and then like if this is 
this is all of our world, you know, this is not somebody else's problem, this is all of our problem. So it, it, it really starts in the areas that you, you and there are people like, uh, like there are consultants like Nancy, of course, and they can go and ask like, oh, what, what, can, what can I do with the food, what can I do with that? And, all, and also when it comes to registration, they can talk to the, um, the, the company that they're working with because as I was mentioning, there are so many different things that you can do. Um, <clears throat> for example, instead of pre-printing badges, now I can just tell you 20 different companies off the top of my head that can print badges on site. So what does it help you? Um, instead of pre-printing badges and losing some time, not to, like, not to mention that, um, you can print them on site and then you can reuse the ones which, which were not used because most of the time, if it's not a paid event, um, you're gonna see like a 60 or 70% attendance. Uh, like that's a number that's, that we, sh we show like in average, the 60 or like between 60 to 70 people are attending events out of the registered guests. So if you are pre-printing, you're gonna lose all the, all the pre-printed badge, badge stock. And not only being unsustainable, you would also be having an operational nightmare of people coming in, trying to find their badge, picking it up, maybe you need to align those the lines. Um, so they just need to think and then, and then the opportunities are endless. Um, and then with working with the correct people and just asking for help, they're gonna, they're gonna get to a lot of help. If somebody asks me about how can I make my registration sustainable, I can talk hours and hours about it. But it's all about asking. Do you want to do that? Because as, um, as, as you guys were saying, it's also a process. Like I have seen, I have converted so many people from pre-printed to print on, on-site printing because they, they get scared. They're like, hey, I have 1,000 people coming in, and what if, what if the system doesn't work? What if I cannot give badges to, to attendees? First of all, it's not the end of the world. Things, and things work sometimes and things, things doesn't work. Um, so you, nobody's gonna die. So people are gonna go in and they're gonna, they're gonna have a great event. But of course, they're like, we have, a, we have proven mechanisms. Um, we can show them how many times we did this for how many customers we did this for, and we can show them, hey, look, like in the demos, if the system goes offline, you can still check people in. If the electricity goes down, because now you're using iPads, everything is it's on battery on them, you know? So if the, the electricity goes down, you have bigger issues inside, but the registration. <laughs> so it's all about asking. And if, if it's all about first, like first, what, what it is, is it's all about you wanna change yourself. And then you should just trust the technology, do your homework well. I'm not saying, hey, come to my company and work with me your homework well, talk to some references, and just believe in the technology. It's going to get you there. Great. Nancy, what would you be your one tip for uh, planners who want to get started? My one tip is just to get started. Yeah. I mean, so many times we look at sustainability, it's big, it's complex. I mean, even here in Portland, if you try to recycle a Starbucks cup, you got your cup. And you're standing there in front of garbage baskets and you know recycling bins. You got your cup, and you got the paper on the straw. Then you got the straw. Then you got the lid. And then you got the cup, which has had coffee in it. So is it compost? Is it waste? I mean, how do we how do we expect this to be easy? Then you start talking about sustainable seafood, and you know it's another huge complex issue. So I just advocate for people to start somewhere. Pick one thing you want to do this year or this event. Do it. Do it really well, do something that's important to your organization, and then benchmark it, measure how you did, and then report out what you were able to do, tell people your story, and then build on it in subsequent events. Because I think that it, so many people have not gotten started because they just think it's so big and overwhelming, and it is if you're going to 100%, nobody's 100%. So just pick something and go, and it'll build on itself. Great. Hans. What are some trends that you're seeing from clients when it comes to moderators and facilitators and sustainability? Um, I see sustainability come into the meeting design. Um, and I think that's where uh, Nancy has her 
uh, wish to be an architect because she, uh, she, she can be a sustainable meeting architect. Uh, it's building your meetings around it. Uh, and like I said, it's, uh, most of the time it's about practical solutions, but um, slowly the, the change of behavior is coming in. And you can see that in the evaluation forms that people fill in after the Congress. Uh, if it wasn't sustainable enough, you get the, the advice and the tips from your audience why not do this next year or why not do that do it in that way next year so people are really trying to 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 help each other to be more sustainable i totally agree with uh, with nancy and uh, you should maybe not try to be perfect but you should try to uh, do something and there's always a compromise i think um, what i also see as a trend is that less is more it's it's going from like i said before a, an eccentric movement from let's add this and then let's add that to the to the meeting to get more experience to get more um, engagement to uh, a, a, another um, a transition to another movement which is more concentric back to the basic back to the goal of your meeting back to what is it that we want to get out of it so the the ROI of your meeting gets more important mm -hmm. and um, then you can skip all the extra stuff and and build on uh, achieving your goal and if you do that well and in an active and interactive way with your audience they will still love your confidence because there's still engagement and there's still uh, an experience but it's all about the content and it, uh, except um, it's, it's about the content and not about the things that you add to it that can also be nice like extra entertainment so if you add entertainment let it add up to the um, uh, goal instead of just make it an add-on and another trend I see is that the um, uh, it, that technology is becoming really important that technology is making the step from being such an add-on to being really important to get me to the goal of the meeting so in the beginning we saw these voting apps that you could use with your uh, with your phone uh, or maybe with special devices that the um, the app company uh, delivered to your Congress or your, your conference and what we see now is that it's most um, um, not only it's not only used as an add-on, as a nice gadget or a gimmick to your uh, to your audience, but you can really use it. And people are making the um, um, are, are trying to to make a difference between a small audience where you can do some body voting to get the same result to larger audiences or maybe anonymous voting, which uh, the uh, voting uh, app will also give you the opportunity to do anonymous, anonymous voting in small audiences. And if you have big audiences, you also need a, a, a thing like that. So I see a change in technology there. The technology is getting more important. The registration as well in, in those beacon things. Uh, there's the privacy issue there. Um, but it's good that we talk about it. It's good that we start um, uh, trying and, and keep developing it together. Can I Great. add on to that? Absolutely. You know where I think technology and the apps, I, I totally believe in green gamification, which is what I call it. But if the, if the apps could have an easy plug-in or be part of the apps moving forward and catch people doing things right. I know there's a couple companies that are, that are working on it, but I'd like to see it um, offered more often. You know, you, like catch, you know, how did you get here? Take a picture of the public transportation. How did you, um, you know, did you bring your own cup and, you know, what did you choose to eat, chicken or beef? I mean, all the things, you know, let us catch you recycling and they and get points for that. And then there's a leaderboard and people love competition, big on competition. So, I mean, the conferences I've seen this do that people get very, very enrolled and it's just part of the app, the conference app, so they're not downloading anything extra. And, I, I don't see it enough, but the green gamification is really going to change as part of the experience. It's really going to change how our attendees see it. And, and I think it could be great fun. Way back, I forget how many years ago, Event Camp Vancouver did a green gamification. They had all this fun stuff um, worked through that. And they had this one like, did you shower with a friend? And so everybody thought it was silly and, and everybody was, you know, of course, picking that one. But, but you know, there's so many ways to make it involved in the attendee experience and that's where I think technology should really be headed with sustainability and uh, there's just so many opportunities. 
Nancy, I'm glad you brought up technology, and I, I know earlier you mentioned with social media, um, you know, there's this microscope on planners. Um, are there tools out there that planners can use to calculate if their event is sustainable or not so that they can prove to stakeholders and their attendees that yes, we are actually doing something and it's making a difference? There are a variety of, there's not, well we have a, you know, to toot our own horn, we have a calculator that does calculate the um, an event from either a, we have a standard or a really advanced version that does calculate and measure 300 different areas in the event. Only That's, 300? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's kind of robust and people are still struggling a little bit, but we don't want it to make it to a point where where we're not calculating everything. So so that's that's our, our problem. We might be a little ahead of the curve. But there's there's other things. There's paper calculators, there's the whole earth calculator. I don't know if you're any of you know about that. Um, do you know Jim Spellows who's in the industry? He helped develop this whole earth calculator where you go in, you talk about the amount of food that you donated. It spits you out how many meals you will be served, and it, it tweets out for you. It's, it's got some great apps that are great uh, features that go with it. And so there's a lot of little ones, but there's there's really not a, a not an easy one per se because you know there's standards that people follow. It gives you some frameworks. Those are pretty rigorous too, whether the ISO 20121 standards or APEC standards. Those are you know, those are, you don't want to do that if you're just starting out. So, but those are the frameworks people are using and, and hopefully sooner or later there'll be um, more things designed around those. So there's little pockets of technology, but we really need the technology that, that enrolls people more in just doing the right thing. Great. I like the gamification idea, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great one. I, I, I'd buy it for all my clients if I can find one. Karim, this is a philosophical question. Are there parts in an event that you think will be extinct due to it not being green or sustainable? And if so, what would those be? Extinct? Um, that's a great question. So, um, well, you, you, you caught me off guard. <laughs> <laughs> For example, you know, there is a time typically at an event where you go and you register. There's open hours for registration. Do you see that potentially going away um, and becoming something different? Because yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, yeah, definitely. For example, as much as we are using um, our phones, uh, for example, Hans was talking about the beacon technology. Um, why aren't we completely using it? Because it's not like the technology is not completely there yet. Okay, so for example, um, we use uh, we we use reusable NFC wristbands um, for access control. For example, you go to a festival, um, like there are two, actually like three or more reasons to use NFC wristbands. One is, for example, let's say there is a like maybe one of the festivals that we work with, there was a silent disco and it was. Um, it was um, sponsored by uh, by a headphone company. Okay, so the headphone company is spending all this money, but they want to know how many people has gone inside and danced. So to be able to do that, you would tap your wristband and pick up the microphone, sorry, the headphone, and when you're walking out, again, you tap your wristband and you leave it. A, it helps you people to get keep track of how many people picked it and how many people left it back, and B. Um, it's 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 good for security. Another uh, usages like there are there were VIP areas. So again, your NFC wristband can tell you if you can go into a room or not. So, do you have to have an NFC wristband for this? No. Like all of us have a cell phone, and we can use the beacons in there. So you can just pull your cell phone out and like tap it there, and then it can tell you like like you you can pair your registration with your phone so this can do the same amount of work so you don't even need an NFC wristband anymore but is it ready yet not really cell phones were able to get through uh, the, like the battery would go for seven days when I was uh, like 15 years old you know 
Now we're struggling to get through the end of the day because it has a bigger cell, a bigger screen. It has LTE in it, so we are lucky if we, you don't need to plug it in till um, till you go to sleep. So once we have cell phones where the battery is not an issue, that can that can be used more because I see a lot of people. We, we try to do beacons in events. It's pretty easy to uh, to do technology, but what's hard is people are going and shutting down their Bluetooth because. They don't want to lose, like they, they want their phone to work till till the end of the day. So that's a small issue. Like we have the, the barrier of humans, like not using technology. And I don't blame them. If the phone is using more battery because of the Bluetooth, I'm closing it too. So then all that work in put into beacons doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, but like they are now putting them into your watches. They're putting them. Uh, into smaller phones. So once the technology is more around, once everybody has a beacon enabled watch in their wrist, then we can say, hey, yeah, maybe you don't need to use like wristbands anymore. You can just use the watch in your wrist or the, the phone in your pocket. So as the technology is growing, yes, I think we're not going to have registration systems. Maybe you, like we, we work with um, like face recognition systems now, so instead of like typing your name, you will just look at the screen, it's going to say checked in, and then you will go in. So, of course, there's still going to be a registration area, but uh, things will change, and the, the, the things that we use, the disposables that we use, will no longer be there. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see with the advances in technology how quickly that changes over. Um, I mean, the, I still know planners who have big, big binders that they carry around their events. So even though the technology is there to get rid of them, um, the rate of adoption uh, is not always there. So I'm, I'm excited to see how quickly, uh, once that technology advances, how quickly it gets adopted. Um, so here's my question for each one of you. And this is really going to be like the last question before we get into the end questions, which we always ask. So I want you each to think about one thing that irks you the most about unsustainable events that you've attended. And I saw Nancy laugh, so I know she has something in mind. <laughs> so we'll start with you, Nancy. Well, there's so many. It's not like one thing. <laughs> I have to pick one thing. I mean, I don't want to pick bottled water because that's so easy, right? I don't want to pick styrofoam cups because that's so easy. All those things are so easy. What I really think irks me the most is when planners have choices and they just don't make the right choices, the right for the environment. There's, there's, oh, there's just so many opportunities. You know, I don't want this on disposable plas black plastic. I want China. I don't want an unsustainable fishery. I want this, and there's so, and it's just the easy button sometimes, or the the facility makes it easy, or whoever makes it easy. But there's you know what it just drives me crazy when there could be some really good choices about destinations can you walk in your destination or take mass transit to the airport to shopping to nightclubs whatever you want to do and they're not weighing those decisions and that's what irks me and so a lot of times you can't actually see what irks me but <laughs> but, but it's an unsustainable event but and they're you know it's there <laughs> and the opportunity was there. You know, let's let's use it. Let's be smart. How about you, Hans? Yeah, more or less the same thing. Uh, I guess it's about um, thinking in old ways and thinking in the ways that you already saw and saw that work once, and think that that will work for every other opportunity that that comes uh, now and in the future. And I think that's a kind of um, it, it. Of course, it helps you, and it helps you make think and organize faster and and. Uh, not necessarily better because every time that you get a new opportunity, you can find new solutions to it, and um, you can help each other with that. Nancy is a consultant in 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 uh, in, in being green, and uh, Graham has uh, is still developing new things um, uh, for the market um, because the market asks for it, mm -hmm. and when you're open to new suggestions, you get better meetings. I think. To give you two examples, um, I, li I like the human-to-human -human approach always in my in my meetings, and I'm not against uh, using technology or voting technology. But if I can do body voting, I like the body voting better because it it moves your body around and it gets your 
uh, blood circulation flowing, for instance. So I'll give you two examples of how you can do um, uh, things in a human, a human way that you usually would do with uh, stuff. Um, at Eventex in Dublin, I invent, you were there, Karim. Um, I invented, uh, instead of a goodie bag, which is a physical goodie bag, I invented not the digital goodie bag, but the mental goodie bag. And I did a little uh, exercise with the audience in which I had them envision all the most important things that they learned or saw or experienced during the two days that they were there. And I had them uh, memorize them in a special uh, 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 mental technique. So if they would meet their um, partner at home or at the office, uh, the colleague at the office, it would come back to them. So it was a mental goodie bag that worked in such a way that uh, the value of the meeting would come back to them at the moment they needed it uh, most. That's one. And the second one is um, you can use those, those badges. And next door I have this bushel of uh, lanyards with, with all kinds of plastic stuff on it that uh, says your name on it. And they tend to twirl. So it, you're always looking at the back of it. It doesn't really work. So I invented, you can use a, a big marker like this. I'm not using it at the moment because tomorrow I have a big conference and it would look a bit odd. But if you use, to, if you write your name on the back of your hand, and we shake hands, you could see the back of my hand and read my name. And if we would turn the other way, I could see the back of your hand and read your name. So that's nice. a good way to, to meet. It's a kind of networking exercise that's really fun. I could even ask you to write my name on my hand uh, with your pen. Uh, so it's, it's, it's close. Uh, the new solution is always close by. And um, you only have to be ready to, um, to open your mind to it and to, 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 be, uh, to be able to accept new things and not, not think any old ways. Great. And how about yourself, Karim? What's the thing that irks you the most? The most is I would say badge holders, because <laughs> yeah, I mean I don't I don't get it. Like <laughs> I don't get it. For example, if you really want to name badge, I mean don't get me wrong. We we also work with a lot of brands which works which has name badges. Fine. If you work if you have a name badge, most of these name badges are for a day for a day, and then. You can just order your name badge with a clip on it, and then you can just like clip your lanyard on the on the name badge itself. You don't need a, another plastic on it. It's it's so unnecessary. And oh, yes, I, I went to this event, and of course I cannot tell which one, um, but they were using plastic badges, uh, like the big plastic badges. I'm like, okay, yeah, they look better, but again, it's not. The, I, I wouldn't say it's the best solution. And they had a plastic badge, and like I would say, 99% of the time, I saw a plastic badge clipped to a lanyard, and this organization was putting the plastic badge in a plastic badge holder. And <laughs> okay, this is that. So I would say the most like the thing. Yeah, I understand some people, some organizations really need to want a name badge, and okay, it's like the paper is like recyclable if you if you have a good uh, like recycle options in your event, but the badge holder is useless. There's, it doesn't mean anything. Like it's, it's empty. It's not gonna. You can just clip the lanyard in the in the badge itself. It's gonna be cheaper for you. It's gonna look the same. It's gonna be even nicer. And when you do lead scanning, for example, it's gonna read better because there's no plastic layer on it. So don't use badge holders, please. I am going on the road with you, and we're just gonna tell everybody that all day long. Because if you if you bruise your badge so bad in a day or two, a paper badge that you can't use it, my God, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, seriously, let's ch spread this word. That is our biggest nemesis here when we do our registration is the badge holders. And, and I just went to an event that I won't say either, but they had their name, the year, in, printed in the plastic name badge. Yeah. You know, everything imprinted in it. I say, if you are standing there at an event and you don't know what year it is, what city you're in, or what event you're at, you got a bigger problem. So forget it. We don't need that. And just think, if you and I could do that, just think how much plastic we could save in a year out of the landfill. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. I love it. I love it. Um, if you still want to use the plastic thing because it, it really helps you in your goal, um, 
can you use another type of plastic, not, not the plastic that comes from uh, petrol, but the plastic that's maybe used uh, uh, made of um, um, uh, sugar or um, other biological stuff, organic stuff? We have tried and tried and tried to find them. There's badge holders that say that they're biodegradable, and they're biodegradable maybe in 99 years in the right kind of landfill or compost. There just isn't anything out on the market today, and uh -huh. that's the frustration is that there's nothing. There's people who say they are, but when you really do your due diligence, it is it is not for the for the duration. And I, I just don't think we need them. I don't. That they're not there. So, so the company that brings that uh, product to the market uh, will have, have us all as a client. Yes. <laughs> if I can't talk them out of any name badge holder at all. If there's all the producers out there. <laughs> I, I want to be aware of time. So we have a couple questions. So let's just rapid fire uh, real quick. If you could only pick one and only one tip for an event planner what would it be? And it can be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be sustainability. So one tip. We'll start with Nancy. I think to look at wise choices and like I said, pick one thing and, and do it and do it well. Great. Hans, go. One tip. Go no to your vocabulary. That's, that's I think my, my basic tip. Add no to your vocabulary. Add no. I like it. And Karim, one tip. Um, don't don't be scared to change. I know a lot of people get scared about that. Don't be scared to change, but at the same time, do your homework well. When you're changing, yeah, it might be uh, it might damage your event or brand. So, do your homework well, but don't 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 scare to change. Change is good. Love it. All right. So I know we asked uh, if you have any new and cool resources. Uh, don't worry, audience. You don't have to take notes. We are taking notes for you, and we will put this up on the website. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's go in reverse this time. Karim, any uh, any new cool resources you want to share? Websites, blogs, gadgets. Well, um, um, like cool new resources. As, as I was saying, like the all, the, the biggest and the, the the trend that I love is the event uh, event apps. Um, as Boom said, we don't do event apps. Uh, we do like more uh, like technologies for the organizers themselves. But there are so many event apps that you can work with, and they're so cool. Like they can do live polling, and uh, they like they they have great experience to you. So I would say just just Google like event apps, and then don't don't hesitate to use them. I love them, and then it's gonna save you so much. It's gonna make you sustainable like when day one. Awesome, Hans. Resources. Yeah, in the event app business, I like Slido because it's fairly very sturdy. Uh, it doesn't do all the stuff that you can imagine, but it's what it does. It does very well, and the people behind it know uh, what's important during conferences. Um, I'd like to mention next to our website, uh, mastersinmoderation.com. Also, our uh, training course for moderators, uh, mastering moderation, uh, because. Um, it helps people when they are learning how to be a moderator to address those issues not only uh, before and but also on stage even. So you can talk to your audience uh, all the way and you can make your meetings more interactive when you're a moderator and, and have the um, be the director on stage more or less. Great. Nancy, resources, I know you got them. I got them and they're they're listed, but everybody keeps asking us for a checklist. Just give us a checklist. Just tell me what to do. Give me a checklist. Don't explain. So we put together, just put together an infographic with 15 tips you can do today. And that's awesome. available on our website for free. Download it. Use it. 15. Go. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you all for such incredible information. Um, so much stuff about sustainability that I didn't even know or think about. So uh, I'll definitely be considering the meetings that I attend in a very different way and looking at them in a different way um, as well. Um, but that's it for today's show. Uh, I'm going to play, play us out, and uh, then you can stick around, and uh, uh, we can have a little chat afterwards. But uh, that's it for today's show. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, make sure you go to event-icons.com 
to watch the replay or send this to anybody that you think would benefit from this information. All right, here we go. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the Twitter conversation sponsored by Alex Plaxon and Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, right here on Hashtag Event Icons. Thanks. Thanks, Alex.